All right, so today, in order to be successful, every single person needs to have uh, their LEQ essay, LEQ prompt, and LEQ planning. You're going to exchange it with someone who has not graded your assignment. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we wrote the first part of these essays together so we can do this first part together, which is pretty exciting. So, everyone in your crayon box, you need to take out green, blue, pink, red. Green, blue, pink, red. Okay, green, blue, pink, red. All right, so looking at the essays that you should have in front of you from uh, someone else, obviously the first thing you're going to do is write on the side your name. So I know exactly who is grading every single essay. Who does not have one because Zeta didn't do it? Hello, who doesn't have one? Everyone has someone else's essay in front of them? Zeta, do you have an essay in front of you or no? Oh, okay, fine, perfect. Okay, so what is going to happen is we're going to color in our thesis just like we have done before. So with our thesis, we're going to use green to restate, color in the restate of the prompt. They're similar in their use of. Okay, so the time period, there is no time period, but I kept saying during ancient times that technically scores, so I'm going to put a blue around that. The three aspects are going to be pink, so trade, implementation, or lack of infrastructure. Those are my three. And then my contextualization, which is going to be red. Now, I wrote this essay, so I know they're all here. So it all works out very quickly. So everyone should be filled in completely and entirely for your thesis. Everyone good? Okay, so let's look at content paragraph one or paragraph two. Now you're going to take your green, you're going to restate the prompt during the time period of Mesopotamia and Egypt. Okay, infrastructure was, okay, so my correct answer, oh you need yellow as well, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to lie to you. You need a yellow as well. Uh, infrastructure was unable to be built up. So unable to be built up is the answer. So that's going to be boxed in yellow. Okay, and then uh, explanation of answer. So explanation of answer. Mesopotamia is located along, so for me it's blue, the unpredictable Tigris and Euphrates River that kept overflowing, making it impossible to build large-scale infrastructure. So I'm just explaining my answer. That's all this is. So that's blue. Now, when you see evidence, there should be two pieces of evidence that are used to prove it. Okay, so ziggurats is the term. We're going to box in ziggurats. Remember, when we talk about evidence, we're talking about a specific term or phrase that is specific to that empire that shows we know things. And the other evidence is Fertile Crescent, that we happen to know that it is called that. That is our pieces of evidence. So that is all you need to color in your first content paragraph. Is everyone clear? Now, if you look on my, uh, my rubric, you're going to see something called synthesis. I have not, have I taught you the word synthesis? No, I haven't taught you the word synthesis because this week we weren't focusing on synthesis. The focus of this week was on what, ladies and gentlemen? Formatting. So, next time we write an LEQ, what do you think the fo uh, focus is going to be? Synthesis. synthesis. And synthesis is very tricky and very hard, which is why we didn't even bother dealing with it this week. Is everyone clear on that? So, are we going to hold them accountable for synthesis this week? No, because you didn't even know it existed until this moment, so how can we hold you accountable? It's not even in my essay, for being honest. Okay? So, what we are going to do now is you're going to look at content paragraph two, and you are going to do the same thing. Go now, please. Content paragraph two.
Seda. This is the essay you're going to write tonight. You should have watched my video and you should have come to class prepared, darling. India, China, the Mediterranean Sea. Now, you need to watch my video. Oh, I'm sorry. I moved it. I'm sorry. What? Whose is that? You want, it's a different essay on the video, but you should still fill, be able to fill out the same formats. The formats is correct. Say so you're going to do the highlighted one. That's the essay you're writing tonight. You need to watch my video first to learn all the different stuff. Huh? Why don't you have access? You don't have a computer at home? You don't have access to YouTube? Huh? Um, well, during your lunch, you could go to the media center as well. Okay? Why don't you try that and let me know how that goes. But worst case, Zeta, you could take a picture of my wall. It says LEQ. That's your formatting for the essay. Doesn't matter, Daniel. What do you need? Uh, yeah. Okay. Wait a second. Wait like 10 seconds and we'll go as a group. Okay. You got about 10 seconds to finish content paragraph two. Shouldn't be that bad because I wrote it for you. Should be pretty easy to do. Yes? So you got about 10 seconds. Four, three, two. One. Okay, so look at their third content paragraph, please. They wrote this entirely on their own, correct? So, ladies and gentlemen, their formatting may not be correct. So you really need to really make sure you're reading it and make sure you're coloring it correctly. So at this point, you're more than welcome to start grading their third content paragraph. It should, could be wrong. So make sure you're paying attention and coloring it correctly, please. So make sure you are reading carefully. What's up? Weren't the conditions more centric than this one? Of course, yes. Now, are we, are we drilling on content this week, ladies and gentlemen? Has that really been my focus? Not really. So we're not going to kill people on content. We're really focusing on formatting. Now, is that going to change? Yes. Do you think AP cares about formatting and content? Yes. But right now I'm not going to harp on people for content. Unless they said that Harry Potter, you know, wrote, you know, Har uh, Harambe's code or Hammurabi's code. That's a problem, right? If it's like a huge glaringly, glaring error, that's a problem. But if, as long as they're trying and they're following the formats, that's what the point of this week was. Got about 20 seconds. Ten seconds. Three. Two. One. Okay, so what we're going to do, and we haven't done this yet, at the bottom of their third paragraph, 
Okay, after the third th content paragraph, you are going to write two positive things. You don't need to write two positive things, like you shouldn't just like put a bullet point, but you're going to write two positive things about their essay. Okay, hold on, do not start writing yet, and then you're going to write one constructive, you're listening, no one should be doing anything, constructive criticism. Who can tell me what constructive criticism is? Who can raise their hand and tell me? Tessa? A suggestion to make it better. A suggestion to make it better. Should you be telling them, oh man, you should quit AP World. This sucks. No, that is not constructive. No one gets better by that. It is simply mean. We are not in the business of mean, ladies and gentlemen, because every single one of you has at some point or will do, will do a shitty job on an essay. Can we agree? We all see that coming. Everyone in this room, including myself, can improve. So constructive criticism is feedback that will make them better writers. Like your third paragraph was very confusing to read. That's constructive criticism. You know, you didn't discuss um, both sides of the argument well. That's constructive criticism. Okay. So when we're talking about constructive criticism, we're not making them feel terrible about themselves or trying to make them better. If you are being mean, I'm going to have a couple things to say to you about it, so don't you dare be mean. Positive feedback that you should be writing down. Positive feedback is um, the way your formatting for this essay is absolutely perfect. That's great positive feedback. Um, your handwriting is very legible and really easy to read. That's positive feedback. On the flip side, constructive criticism is your handwriting is terrible. Now, ladies and gentlemen, on your weekly assignments, I am not going to criticize your writing. You've seen my writing. It's not that pretty. Can we agree? It's also because I write for you, and I know you're just copying me down, and I'm making your life easier, so I'm kind of like, ah, screw it. I'm just going to go. Right? But do you think if I was having this graded by real people, for sure, do you think it would be cleaner, or do you think it would be more chaotic? It would be much cleaner. So while you're writing your essays, you have to practice good writing skills because on the AP exam, every grader has to read and score 700 essays in a week time. How much time do you think they're going to give to you and your terrible handwriting? They get paid $9 an hour. How long do you think they're really going to spend if your essays are a mess? They're not. Okay? It's not worth it to them. They're going to try, but they're not going to kill themselves doing it. So you need to make sure that your handwriting is clear enough that it can be read. Is everyone clear? During writing week, I will be harping on you for your handwriting if it's just too messy. Now, am I looking for perfectly printed words? No, absolutely not. Look at this, for God's sake. Okay, who am I to really judge? But it has to be legible that people can actually read because I've had kids who should have earned fives on their exams who've earned fours, and I know it's because their handwriting was atrocious. So I don't want that to happen to you, so we got to fix it. So constructive criticism, uh, one piece of constructive criticism, two pieces of positive. So go and make it meaningful. Don't say, great job. No one wants to hear that. That's such a copy, like a cop-out. Don't do it. Write two good things about the essay. Or like, you know, your final essay, your final paragraph was really good, really well done. Like, that's nice because they actually wrote that one. Are you in, Allie? Yeah. Are you in, Jose? Uh, I Okay, it didn't show up on me, but I'm glad to hear it. Perfect. All right, good, nice. Crossing these two off. Perfect. Were there a lot of people there doing the same damn thing? Just you? Perfect. So, uh, Jose and Ellie, you're going to turn in your LEQ, your planning, and your essay. You're going to staple it and put it in the drop-off box. It's going to go prompt, planning, essay. And you're going to put it in the drop-off box, and I will score it myself. Okay. So, everyone should have three things down. Two positives, one constructive criticism. Really going above and beyond on those compliments over there. Michael, calm down. Oh my god. What's the blue thing called again? The, the blue thing? The blue stuff we highlighted. The explanation of the answer? Okay. Yeah, say love here. They're still working on it.
Okay, now what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, your restating of the prompt. If you look at this little rubric we had for only the third paragraph, they should have included the time period or a reference, just like we did. You know how we said during the time period of Mesopotamia and Egypt, they should have acknowledged the time. Restate the prompt, correct answer, explanation, and evidence. They should have two pieces of evidence. Everyone's clear on that. So go through, do they have all these pieces? One, two, three, four, five, six. If they do, to the side of their paragraph, write a six out of six. If they have everything they're supposed to, can give them a six out of six. If they only have one piece of evidence, give them a five out of a six. If they don't have some sort of period reference, give them a four out of six and take off the points. So everyone should have a score next to it. Now what you are going to do is you are going to take the prompt, the planning, and the essay. You are going to put the prompt on top, the planning goes second, and the essay on the bottom. Prompt. Planning essay. I am actually. Okay, so it goes prompt, planning essay. Prompt, planning essay. We're going to do it in a second. So as soon as you have a stapler on your desk, people, that's priority one. Staple it and pass it. Jose and Ellie, you're turning yours in the front row. Oh, yeah. That should be part of your instructions. Yeah, I want separate space. Okay, so. Ladies and gentlemen, once you've stapled it, you should be looking at the very prompt. On the prompt, you're going to write the grand total by what they had out of six by their name at the top to make it easier for my girl Madison to record them. So, you are going to write the grand total by their name on the top of the prompt, right where we typically record most of our scores. Okay? So, Please listen, you've never had these instructions before. When I say go, you're going to get up and go talk to the person you've graded. You're going to tell them two positive things about their writing. You're going to tell them what your constructive piece of credit Jose, the box is in the front. You're turning your you're going to tell them two positive things and one constructive piece of criticism. You're also going to tell them your score that you've given them. You're going to have a conversation about it. When I uh, go, get up and go talk to your person. I just gave you like a six out of six. I thought it was like really good. The only thing I said was uh, I had trouble finding like the explanation. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's a big one. If you have a stapler, when you're done, bring it to the front. Five. Four. Three. Two, one. How does it feel to be done with your first writing week? Good. How'd the LQ go? Thumbs up, thumbs down, or eh. All right, do we like it? Raise your hand if you like the LQ. Well, it's better than a DBQ. <laughs> so you'll hate the DBQ more if that gives you any type of excitement for it. So, all right. Ah, uh, congratulations, you just finished writing week. You should be very proud, you should be very uh, happy. I'm glad to hear that at the beginning of the class you all agree that you definitely got better. So if you see that there's a reason why we do this, not just because I enjoy torturing you. So what you are going to do is you are going to please pass Mr. Lopez your essays. Do not hand him an individual, hand them a bunch. Why does he have his prompt?
You always have your prom. You always have your prom. You always have your prom. That's annoying. Okay. Put it. Pass it over to Mr. Lopez. Oh, I'll take that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, congratulations. Week five is over. We are now in week six. We are now in week six. So let's talk about what the assignments are. Last uh, Friday, uh, the Friday I wasn't here because I went to Harry Potter World with Bestie. You remember that? And I came in super early that day and had a bunch of assignments in the front of the room that you guys took home just in case we weren't going to be together for a very long time. Okay? If you did not pick up assignments that time, you can pick them up as you leave. You should have them. They're called Byzantine and Kiwi in Russia. Some of you have even started them, you weirdos. Which is great for you this week because, I mean, less homework you have over the weekend. Uh, but if you do not have Byzantine and Kievian Russian assignments, they're in the front. Thank you, Dad. You knew, you knew what you were getting into when you signed up with me. You knew. So... And I bribed you with Coke, so like, yeah, it's okay, no. yes. Okay, so everyone should have their assignments for the week. You should have already had them, most of you, if you were here that Friday. Um, your assignments are due regular time. So if you've already, anyone here have already started these assignments? Okay, well, first period did not get the memo that these are week six assignments, and some kids have them completely done. I was like, how did you do that on top of writing? Because they were like, it was a really stressful week. I was like, didn't you find it weird that there was no acknowledgement of, like, a pieces? Or, and they're like, I thought it was kind of weird. I was like, you didn't think to ask? And they're like, no. Cool. So, tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, you are doing a map. Nothing? We don't have a little bit of excitement for a map? We could do an essay again. Yeah, no? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So now we have some faint excitement. Friday, you have vocab 1 through 10 in a lecture. Monday, 11 through 20 in a primary source, which you haven't seen in, like, months, it feels like. Uh, Tuesday, you have 21 through 30, a lecture. Your map and your primary source are due on Tuesday. For the rest of your life, your map and your primary are due on Tuesdays. Uh, and then Wednesday, you have a test, 25 questions, of course, multiple choice. And then you have your focus and your pieces are due on Wednesday of next week. So, of course, you're going to look at your scope and sequence this week and figure out what pages of the book that you're responsible for, correct? And that's how you're going to fill out your assignments. So, we have, like, what, 15, 20 minutes? Okay, so we're going to start week six content because there's no point in wasting our time because there's a lot of stuff we've got to go through. So, open up your notebooks to a new page, week six. What? Yesterday? No. Because we only had 20. Oh, yeah, it was yesterday, actually. Yeah, you're right, because you people are weird because of the ring ceremony. So, yeah, you did have a book out because yesterday. Huh? No. No, I do not. Why would I want you to do that now? That is your responsibility to make it up before school, after school, or during lunch. We're about to transition to notes, so don't you think you should be prepared for that? Thank you for listening, Zeta. Okay, here we go. So, on the top of your notes, you should have week six. You're going to write Europe is where we're going to start. Ah, oh, you guys unplugged my thing. Andrew, can you plug me in? Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, it's going to take a second for my projector to load. Uh, speaking of, though, since I do have a moment and clearly a stage, I do want to take a second and recognize today is September 11th. Uh, today is the 18th anniversary of... 9-11 uh, in 2001. 9-11 uh, was a big day for me. Um, I have a distinct memory. It's called a, uh, I have an episodic memory. When you get to AP Psych, I'll teach all about that. I know exactly where I was when I found out the news. My brother, who was a senior in high school at the time, I was a freshman, he was a senior in high school, he told me that a plane hit the, hit the towers. I'm from Boston, not from New York, so the World Trade Towers didn't mean anything to me. I've seen them, but like, you know, someone's saying, oh, I hit the towers. So I was in the science wing of my high school, 
and we went to the pool because we both worked for the pool. I did swim lessons for little kids. And we went there and we turned on the TV. Uh, Chappie, who was running the pool, uh, had the TV on. We walked in and we saw the second plane hit. Now, my I used to live in the suburbs right outside of Boston. Marathon started two miles away from my house. That's how close I was. Um, I knew five people who died on September 11th, 18 years ago because a lot of the people who lived in my town were a lot of your pilots and your uh, service staff who were on the planes. You know, we happened to know five people who died that day. One person I happened to know in New York who died, and then the other four were people on the planes. Uh, September 11th was a big day. Um, one of my biggest memories was I went to a soccer game. We were playing our rival that day, and the game was canceled. We lowered the flag, and we all went home, and we sat on the couch, and we watched the news. I remember a documentary about a week later where they showed me footage. There happened to be a firefighter uh, documentary clue uh, following a, a New York City fire department. And he went in, the documentary uh, director, the filmmaker, went in with the firefighters who went into the building. And they were showing this footage like a week later. And the whole time you just kept hearing in the background. And like I remember turning my parents like, what is that noise? We just kept hearing plunk, plunk. And at the end of the documentary, they announced that like all of those plunks that you heard throughout were people jumping from hundreds of stories in the air. And for that had such a huge impact on me. Because imagine how bad it was up there that your best option was to jump out of a window, that you knew you weren't gonna make it. Um, so 9-11 is a huge deal, obviously the, the impact we've had on wars here. Um, some of you probably know someone who served in Iran, Iraq, or Afghanistan in the last 18 years. Anyone? I know I have four people who I know who've served. But that would not have happened unless for 9-11. You know, and to recognize their service is to recognize what started the whole thing. So, you weren't alive, right? Yeah, your babies. So, what you should do tonight, you should talk about it. Ask your parents where they were. They can probably tell you exactly what they were wearing, where they saw it, where they were when the second plane hit. Because after the first plane hit, everyone was just like, oh my god, that's so weird. Did you hear a plane hit the Twin Towers? Because it's happened before. They were playing, a little propeller plane hit the towers, and the guy was just confused, got caught in a gust, and hit the towers. So it wasn't until we had the second plane hit, which people were watching live, because everyone was like, oh man, the train, the first tower, the tower's been hit. So everyone was watching, and a lot of the country was watching it live when the second plane hit. Once the second plane hit, it was confirmed this is a terrorist attack of the United States is under attack. Um, our school in Boston, like I said, we had a bunch of people. All the planes flew out of Boston, by the way. They flew out of Boston. It was complete lockdown in Bo the city of Boston because they weren't sure how many terrorists were wandering around the city. So it's clearly the planes came from Boston. Um, the whole school was under a mandatory lockdown for the entire day. We were not allowed to watch TV. I never, I saw the plane hit the building, the second plane, and then we were like, oh shit, and then there was an announcement that the lockdown. So we ran to class, and in the lockdown, you weren't allowed to watch TV. Now some teachers broke the rules, which, hell yes, not my teachers, damn it. Uh, but most people were sitting there. You weren't allowed to be taken out of the school. Uh, you weren't allowed to leave. I mean, everything got kind of canceled for like the next like week after. It has a huge impact on our lives. If you were around for it, you remember exactly where you were. You should talk to your parents today about it. Especially if you've had people who served in Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, you should have a little bit more information about why. Um, my husband's best friend served in Iraq. He led, he was part of the invasion of Iraq which if you've ever heard, is just the craziest wild thing. They had F-15s, which are our fastest bombers, as well as three, uh, 500 tanks roll into Iraq. And he was on a tank rolling into Iraq when they invaded, which is insane. He signed up on September 12th for military service. It's a huge deal, it's a big deal. I love playing high school for the fact that they do recognize it. A lot of places they really don't. If you haven't seen the front of the school where they have flags to memorialize all 2,998 people who died on September 11th, you should go see it. It's uh, very emotional. It's something you should see because um, it's had a huge impact on your life. The fact that you airport security is now crazy. The fact that 
you know, um, so many different components of your life are changing, you don't even know because you weren't even around to see it before. Um, so please uh, take a moment, talk to your parents about it today. They'd probably love for you to ask because people don't know what to do with you people. Because for all of us who live through it, it's just like I assume the people in Pearl Harbor, you know, all of those people are like, oh man, this is such a big deal. On today in 2019, on December 7th, do we really sit there and say, oh man, Pearl Harbor? Or do we just kind of acknowledge it and move on? Just kind of acknowledge Just kind of like you guys. I would talk to your parents about it. It's a huge deal. Shapes the way American policy is made today. Um, it's a huge deal. Still, obviously, today, we've heard about John Bolton getting fired, right, from president. Got fi fired his secretary of uh, Homeland Security. No? Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. So, talk about it today. It's a very big deal. You should, uh, you should be thinking about it and keeping these people in your thoughts because um, a lot of things have uh, occurred because of it. All right. All right, I'm off my soapbox. Here we go. Europe should be your heading. Okay, Europe, and this is going to be post-Rome. Post-Rome. Okay. So, we're going to talk about Rome for a second, though. So, you need to know that Rome is divided into two parts. Rome is divided into two parts by a guy named Diocletian. And I'll write his name up for him. You need to know that Rome is divided into two parts by a guy named Diocletian. Diocletian, okay? He is a, the, one of the last Roman emperors, okay? He divides Rome in half, okay? He creates an East and Western Rome. You need to know that. I put it underneath. Eastern Rome is going to have the capital of Constantinople. Eastern Rome has the capital of Constantinople. And you need to know that it thrives because of trade. Eastern Rome has the capital of Constantinople and thrives because of trade. Okay? Then you have Western Rome. Western Rome has the capital of Rome. Right? Does that make logical sense? Western Rome has the capital of Rome and it collapses very quickly. So, Diocletian divides Rome into two. Why do you think he divides it into two? Let's just talk basic facts here. Andrew. It's too big. It's too big. If something's too big, what do you do? Divide he divided it in half, and that's exactly what he did. You need to know that your boy Diocletian was trying to save Rome. He was trying to save Rome. Okay? However, it only expedited its end. Okay? So, Diocletian was trying to save Rome. However it is going to uh, make it exponentially faster. Okay, so because of it, it's actually going to uh, happen faster. You need to know underneath it, put another point, you need to know that 75, 95% uh, of Roman history, it's polytheistic. 95% of Roman history, Rome is polytheistic. 5% of Roman history, it's Christian. So at the very end, they're going to convert to Christianity. Very, 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 very end. So when you think about Rome, should you think of it as a Christian empire? No. It's polytheistic, like 95% of it. Okay? You need to know that a guy named Constantine, you should have heard of his name before, have we? Yes. Constantine. creates Constantinople. You need to know that Constantine is going to create Constantinople. Under Constantine, he does the Edict of Milan. Who can raise your hand and tell me the Edict of Milan? Uh, Mr. Lopez. Yeah, made Christianity illegal. It's going to happen in the division of Rome. Okay, so Constantine creates Constantinople. He creates the Edict of Milan, okay? Um, and those are the two things you need to know about him. So you really need to realize that Christianity is not a thing in Rome until the very, very end, okay, as it's dying. Okay, 
So, from what you just read, you should know that the eastern half survives, the western half collapses. The eastern half survives because of what, people? Great. Great. And that's where we're going to start. Skip a space, center it, Byzantine. Skip a space, center it, Byzantine. Did you write everything? Mm -hmm. That's all Okay, you need to know the Byzantines are located on, their capital is Constantinople. You need to know that their capital is Constantinople. Byzantines, their, lo, their capital is Constantinople. Okay. You need to know that their government is based on Caesaropapism. Ladies and gentlemen, does that sound like evidence? Yes! This is a wonderful piece of evidence that you would use in an essay if you have an essay about the Byzantines. Caesar of Papism is uniquely Byzantine. Okay, so here we go. Their entire government is based on Caesar of Papism. Caesar of Papism believes that there is a powerful centralized figure in the emperor. The emperor is a powerful central figure means they control all aspects of government. So you need to know that. The emperor controls all aspects of government. You need to know that the emperor consider himself divine authority. You need to use that term. He considers himself on divine authority. Now, as a Christian, he's not allowed to call himself a god. Who can raise their hand and tell me why he can't call himself a god if he's a Christian? What do you got, Zeta? Okay, it's monotheistic, and what's like the number one rule? Don't worship other gods. Don't worship other gods, and there is only one true god, correct? So, if he is a Christian, he can't call himself a god, okay? Because then there's two gods, and obviously he's breaking the rule, and it's the number one rule. So, he says pretty good. God selected him to rule, so who are you to challenge God's will? If God chose him to rule, who are you to challenge his will? That's a pretty good argument. Imagine saying that to your mother. Your mother comes to you and says, why is your room dirty? And you believe you are divine from God, like God hand selected you, and you just say it's God's will. And your mother's like, You've got to be kidding And she's like, No. And you're like, God made me this way. And who are you to challenge God's will? Your mother smacks you across the face and says, Clean up your damn room. That's exactly how that would go, so I would not do that. Okay? So, Caesar of Papism is the belief that the emperor has been hand selected by God to rule. So, who are you to challenge him? What? Can you imagine waking up every single day being like, you know what? God put me here on earth, right here to do this very job. Okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you right now, there is someone on the planet who does believe that God hand selected them. And that's the Queen of England. The Queen of England truly, 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 truly believes God selected her to rule. Okay? Now, do the British call it Caesar of Papism? You need to know that Caesar of Papism is the foundation of what will become divine right. Caesar of Papism is only for the Byzantines. Everyone else changes it slightly to make it divine right. The Queen of England, who's like 400 years old at this point, I mean, my God, the woman at some point is going to die. She believes every single day that she has been hand selected by God. And the reason why, at like 400 years old, she hasn't given up her authority is because God wants her in power. Can you imagine being that certain about anything in your life? Oh, man. That'd be crazy, right? Anyway, have a good day. Enjoy no homework tonight. I can't hear you. What, my darling? Uh, sure. It's in the book. You can help yourself. Oh, thank you, my darling. There's a few over there that are like, I don't know. That's fine. So. All right. Which ones have you done? Uh, the bigger size. Yeah.
Yeah, we're doing it. 